On today's show, we are back talking about the number one pick overall and, of course, the Atlanta Hawks options at the top of the draft. We'll get into all of that and more on part one of two with Bryce Hendricks, and that's coming to you right now. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1725 of Locked On Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you on a Tuesday evening into Wednesday. And today's show is brought to you by the folks at FanDuel Sportsbook. If you're a new customer, get 150 in bonus bets. So any winning $5 bets, and the place to go is FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. I also want to tell you at the top of the podcast, as I always would, to make us your first listen each and every day. Check us out and subscribe to Locked On Hawks anywhere you might find your podcast. That includes Spotify and Apple, as well as YouTube on the video side. And I'm joined momentarily by Bryce Hedricks of Upside Swings uh, for an NBA Draft conversation. Once again, we are about four weeks away as I'm recording this podcast from the NBA Draft. We're getting closer and closer. And of course, the Hawks are technically on the clock right now. So plenty to get to on that. Please uh, note this is part one of two. So stay tuned after this for part two on your podcast feed of choice. And without any further delay, here we go with Bryce Hendricks and part one of two on the NBA Draft. I am joined now by the second consecutive Bryce on this podcast. Bryce Hendricks, how are you, sir? I'm great. I'm great. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be back on. Uh, you know, I was uh, slightly disappointed by my guy, Mo Gay, not having a, getting a ton of run this year, <laughs> sadly, but uh, excited to be back and talking about uh, the number one pick. Yeah, it was on my list to make sure people, people might remember that you came on the show, of, you know, like 10 months ago now to talk about Mo Gay because you covered him at Washington State and you were intimately familiar with his game. Just so you know, Hawks fans love Mo Gay. Uh, everybody's all in on him. He got banged up this year, but just I, I can tell you, I can assure you the Hawks fans are super high on, on Mo Gay and uh, with good reason because he's actually very interesting. But we'll save Mo Gay talk for later on for the <laughs> most part. Um, number one, I appreciate you being here. Uh, you do lots of NBA draft content in addition to your other things that you do in life. I know we all have other things that we have to do. Um, but, you know, I guess I this is one way to ask the question and kind of do it all at once. I've been asking everybody kind of how big their universe is for what the Hawks should be considering number one overall. Not not necessarily Intel, but like what you would be thinking about, like how many guys that they should at least think about. And it kind of, it kind of ties in with like the whole top of the draft conversation too, which we can go there if you want to, but what do you make of this situation that they have, uh, this decision that they have to make? I think some of the, some of the reporting is maybe narrowed to two or three guys, but at the same time, this is still one of those drafts that as of you know late May, it's still fairly open, I think, number one overall based on what I'm hearing. So how would it, how, how open would it be for you, or is there a guy or two that you would uh, certainly just kind of prioritize over the rest? Yeah, you know, I, I think my universe is maybe even smaller than some would have. For me, it's really four guys who I would have uh, as, as a potential number one. Uh, the, the usual name, Alex Saar, um, I, I would have Montas Buzelis uh, in my in my range there, um, and then uh, well, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about the potential weirdness of fit here with these next two. But I'd also have Reed Shepard and Isaiah Collier uh, as as two guys um, at, at number one. Though that's kind of my universe. Um, I'm I'm quite a bit lower on a guy like Topic, Reese Shea. I, I think there's some intrigue there. I I, I like him a little bit, but it, uh, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't take him over any of those four with any type of comfortability. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, uh, some other guys, Cody Williams that are kind of in that area, just don't really move me enough. That, those are the four guys who I think uh, fit, fit the, uh, the, what you'd be looking for in a potential number one, even in a draft like this in, in, in certain ways, I actually have them in the same tier with some guys who I wouldn't actually consider at one just because they're older guys like Jalen Tyson, Devin Carter, I also have kind of in like that that range that that world, but because they're older and there's less like um, ceiling there, I, I wouldn't actually consider them a number one. So those are the four for me right now. Yeah, and uh, you know I'm sure Hawks fans would be a little bit surprised maybe about what what you just said of those of those guys, and that's part of the reason I have I endeavor to have a lot of different people on the podcast because I don't want people to all think the same. Uh, I think. Some of the reporting, and I've talked about it before, I'll talk about it again, seems to be on, on the Saar, Risa Shea, maybe Donovan Klingon train. That trio has been like what's been reported. Now, look, everyone has also said, and I would say the same, that the Hawks are intentionally messaging they have to me and other people that they are 
doing the, the casting a wide net thing. Like they're not committing, they're not even leaking that they're trying to do anything right now. It's still really early as we're talking, even though it feels like it's not early anymore. We're under a month, but it's still early in draft in draft world, basically. So um, I want to get to the more off the beaten path guys that you brought up in a second. But I let's start with the conventional guy, and that's Alex Sar, the guy that I think almost everyone has in their like top three. Not everybody has a number one, but I feel like he's almost on everybody's top three or four. And I think if you pull Hawks fans right now, not all of them, but the majority of them are on Alex R. Island right now. I think people, at least in my universe of Twitter and YouTube comments and emails and things, everybody seems to want Alex R. And I, and I get it. So he's on that list for you. What makes him appealing for you? And then we'll circle back on what might concern you because this, uh, as, as the case for all of these guys, I'm sure that you would agree. There's Everybody's got flaws at the top of this draft. So what do you make of the – what's the case in your mind for Alex R. at number one? You know, Alex R is the guy in this class who feels the most like a number one overall pick. Seven mm-hmm. one, he's flashed some shot making. Being French helps at this point, honestly. If we're being honest, coming after Wemby, it's you know it's very <laughs> similar to how people were selling Denny Avdia after Luca's Luca's rookie year, right? Where it's like, oh, big you know European with uh, if you squint, you can see a similar skill set. Um, you know, I think uh, the sell for Sar is that he has all the a lot of the tent pole stuff you look for from a, a really interesting seven one guy. I mean, he's, he's a real seven one. He, he's huge. Um, the ground coverage stuff defensively is uh, potentially elite. I think like, like he fits the mold of, you know, the when Wemby's obviously a high bar, but, but the Chet or Mobley or, you know, another one is Derek lively, like big man type, just in that he can cover a lot of ground without sacrificing um, driving angles. That's not necessarily to say he's like a great switch guy, um, but you could see him doing a lot potentially as a guy who can rove the back line, but who could also get up on screens if needed. And, and you can see the outline of a versatile defensive player, even if, you know, we'll talk about the concerns in a second. I, I, I do have some questions there. And then offensively, you know, there's some clear craft and touch there. Uh, even if I don't know that he's ever really been particularly effective in FIBA, in um, in the NBL, and OTE, you know, I don't, I don't know that he's ever actually been a truly effective offensive player. But there's always been that kind of surrounding, again, like the tent pole stuff that's really interesting. I, I think he's probably going to make shots. I think the touch is really, really good, to be honest. And to me, that's the most important uh, indicator of, of, you know, future shooting. Um, you know, I, I think he needs to fix his footwork. Um, he needs to get, um, you know, more consistent body mechanics, but that's generally just an easier thing to do. Um, and, and I think the the touch is there. The question will be, can he? Can, is he just someone who's going to stand and shoot spot up shots, or can he do some pick and pop stuff? Um, that that's the question for me. But I'm I'm confident he can at least space the floor if your goal is to play kind of the modern five out stuff. Um, he could he could be a dunker spot guy. Um, there's these these little moments of uh, you know where he, where he'll attack someone off the dribble or you know do some interesting stuff like that. Um, but uh, you know I, he's also a devastating transition player, and I think that's what goes really underrated with him. Whether it be grab and goes or it be um, running the floor without the ball, I, you know I, he has a floor of someone who at the very least is going to be a good offensive big just because he is seven one and will beat guys down the floor. Uh, he gets early position. Well, and he can also grab and push the ball a little bit and all that stuff combines to make him, uh, you know, I, I, I think there's some ceiling there, but he's also, I, I think there's some safeness there that in this class, if you're taking number one, a GM is like, well, it checks the box of, he probably won't get me fired. And that, that is kind of important. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, and it's worth like all time right now in the NBA and the NHL. FanDuel's giving you a shot to bring home the win of your own. FanDuel is America's number one sportsbook, and right now, if you're a new customer, get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150 for dollars you can bet on hoops, baseball, hockey, and so much more. You can bet all of, all, all of your fa- favorite, favorite stuff across the board in baseball, basketball, etc., and with teams that you like, players you like, etc., with quick bets, live team game parlays, exclusive props, and much more. The Federal Sportsbook app is really easy to use, and they also have everything you're looking for in the sports betting space. They have over-unders, they have money lines, they have player props, they have future bets, 
and much more. The Fiddle app is safe, it's secure, and they cover the entire range of sports as well. That, of course, has the NBA at the top of the list, WNBA, football stuff when it's in season, NFL, college football, MLB, college baseball is popular right now, golf, tennis, soccer, auto racing, boxing, MMA, and much more. And now is an awesome time to with the folks at the FanDuel Sportsbook. And the place to go is FanDuel.com slash locked on. One more time, as the place to visit right now is FanDuel.com slash locked on and make every playoff shot count with the folks at FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. I was going to ask you at some point, it's a good time to go, go ahead and do it now, about kind of the, not necessarily the floor outcomes, because floor for anybody is the actual floor is really low on almost any on any prospect, but the realistic floor, the median outcomes or whatever on Alex are. And it's interesting to me because you mentioned his offense and kind of the touch he has. And I know something that other people that I trust are talking about, like the intriguing potential, not only just the mid range stuff and the like floater game, that kind of stuff or out to three point line, hopefully in the future. But one of the questions is, you know, can he finish or can he fish around the rim, fish through contact? He's not the most physical guy in the world right now. Um, and the way he plays part of that's, you know, he's 19 playing in the pro league against adults and that's kind of what it is. But um, some of the numbers around the rim are not the best for a guy with, with his tools, for instance. Um, and then there's the whole question about like, is he a, is he a center or not, which can it be overblown, but also does matter. I mean, t- team building wise, uh, I think you would like to know what you think of him anyway. It doesn't mean that he has to become what you think of him, but if you're drafting him as the Hawks, you probably have to have an idea in your head. Is he our five of the future? Or is he a guy that we think might be a little bit more of a four or five? That way you're going to have to have another five on the roster if, if that's an option for you, which isn't a bad thing. It's just that you, you, you probably need to know that, at least have an idea about that. So convoluted way to ask it, but is there is there – you mentioned safety. Like projectability-wise, what do you make of that? Because we'll talk about defense in a second, but off, offensively there's that question about his interior stuff and then defensively like anchoring – the defense versus being this all court weapon, which by the way, still has huge value. Like you said, but like, again, the guy you, the guy you pair next to him does kind of matter. I know, I know we're already two steps beyond that, but at number one overall for a team that's already decent enough right now, it's not a rebuilding team right now. This is an interesting competition, especially for a team. That's not a one up and slate. Like if you went to Washington, it's like, all right, who cares? Figure it out later. But in Atlanta, you kind of have to know. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's, it's even more interesting when, when, you know, you think about, you know, Trey Young or DeJounte Murray, probably one of those guys is going to be on this team, I would imagine. Um, you know, those are fairly high volume pick and roll players. I don't think Sar necessarily projects super high level as a pick and roll big. I, I actually think, I think the best role for him is sort of as that more for like, like four or five, whatever you want to call him, but in sort of a two big system offensively and defensively. Um, because I think the big weakness of his game on both ends for a seven-one guy is pick and roll stuff. I, I think he's a pretty bad pick and roll defender right now, um, and, and Australia is not exactly like a good pick and roll league. Um, you know, his, his best stuff defensively is when he's kind of roaming the backside, uh, and he gets to be that guy who stays at the rim while there's another big who who stays in the main action. Um, and then you know, offensively, I think he's at his best um, when he can either catch and, and shoot or catch and rip or, or do something. You know, he does have, I think the handle's kind of real in that, like, I, there's some real adaptability and shift to it. He just, he's just, is, is that he's athletic, but he's not athletic enough for a 7-1 guy to, to really maximize that. He doesn't extend his stride lengths well. Can't really bend to get hips. It's not an advantage creating handle, but, like, if there's another big closing out on him that has to actually close out because he can make a shot, like, he can hit a move and get by that big. And, and, yeah. and that's worthwhile to me. Um, I also think there's some stuff there with him as a dunker spot guy. He's good when he can just catch a lob from a standstill because he has a, a gigantic standing reach and, you know, he can get pretty high even though it takes a little bit to load. But the reason I don't like him as a as a pick and roll big is because he really struggles with combining uh, or flowing from a catch to a finish. Uh, it, there's, there's almost always a pause in his movements um, and, and, you know, that, that sort of has the feel of someone who is more comfortable with the ball Well, he's never going to have the ball all the time. So, you know, finding a role where he's kind of more perimeter oriented or like purely dunker spot next to another big, you know, I could see there being some stuff where, you know, Onyeka Kongu is used maybe a little bit in the short role and, and you take advantage of SARS either spacing or, you know, maybe, maybe backside cutting gravity, uh, to create some stuff there. Uh, I think he could be effective in some Spain stuff in time, but uh, I think positionally uh, he makes the most sense next to another big, 
but that's there, there's give and take there because the other big also has to have a certain level of skill. You know, he's right. probably not going to be great next to a Clint Capella because Clint Capella can't make short roll passes. You know, Clint, Clint Capella is not really operating dribble handoffs in, in a way maybe a, an Okongwu could. So that's that's sort of the the toughness of the fit there. But I also do think there's there's a world where it makes the most sense to develop him next to a guy like an Okongwu uh, moving forward. Yeah, and you know, there's that there's a big split there. I mean, and that's the thing about it. Like, and if you're the Hawks, you gotta think about what you believe that he'll be long term again. Um, because I, I do think that he and Akongwu in a vacuum does make a lot of sense together. You know, those guys, Akongwu does have some size concerns at the five, but if your power four is Alex R, like that covers up for a lot of that stuff. But then you throw in the 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 curveball there is that Jalen Johnson is their current power forward, and Jalen Johnson is untouchable in their mind like they love Jalen johnson they think he's going to be a star so how does that all work and i won't make you go into that necessarily but that's mm-hmm. one of the questions that is out there people keep asking i'm sure you're not surprised by this but there's always a question i get about can Jalen saw and a Kongwu play together and my answer is yes but i don't think it's like going to be what they try to do all the time like that's i think offensively it's a little clunky maybe if saw becomes what he could be high end outcome offensively and the shot works and all that stuff and maybe it would unlock and be awesome but um it's just it's a question. We don't, have to, we don't have to do an hour on Alex R, but that's a question. And then defense, we, talk, we talk about the offense. The, defensively, you talk about his pick and roll defense. I agree with you. Just the anchor, the rebounding is a question too. I, I think that you see a guy who's 7 1, who's athletic, and you don't think he's going to be a bad rebounder. Right now, he's not a great rebounder. Like the numbers kind of tell that story. If you watch him on film, it's not great as a rebounder. And, you know, if you're the only big, that matters more. If you're not the only big, like you just said, that it matters less. And that kind of goes into that too. So also just the dark arts in general. And that's something that um, every time I bring it up, people get mad at me. I'm not saying he has to have it all now. He's 19 years old, but he doesn't have it now. So mm-hmm. it, you're, it, you're, you're projecting the screen setting and the way, all the little things that you have to learn how to do, especially if you're a full-time five, you have to hope he learns that stuff. And it doesn't mean he can't, it's just that he hasn't done it yet. So we touched on him a lot, but it, it's one of those. He's obviously the number one topic still. There's other guys in the mix, but it seems like you'd be com- so. I'll ask you this question. It's very, it's probably too simple, so you can answer however you want. The Hawks announced Alex R is the pick on on July. Sorry, on June 25th, 26th. That feels how to you? What would what would your reaction be like? Okay, I, I, is it is it I, is it I, I get it? Is it I'm excited? Is it like I don't like that at all? Like, what, what would your reaction be to that? It'd be what I expected, I think. I mean, uh, I actually feel the same way with Reese Ache, and I actually think, even though for me he's in a lower tier, like I'd even I, I'd feel about the same for Saar and Reese Ache here because I do think Jalen Johnson is so good, and, and Reese Ache is definitely a more comfortable fit next to Jalen Johnson, right? Just because yeah. he's a guy where if he can shoot, he doesn't take anything off the table. He's a good cutter transition player. There's just very little on ball equity there for me. That's why I'm I'm lower on him. I don't think there's like star offense or defensive player there but if, if he makes shots like he's a really good defensive player you know all of a sudden you'd have a really good three four defensive tandem uh and it, and it seems like he's making shots right now i i i really <laughs> can't stand his mechanics but you know uh he's he's a fair enough bet there but yeah i mean if they draft sorry i'd just be like well I, I i mean it's it's probably a good place for him to develop like Something uh, when I when we did our podcast on Star, something I I noted is that I'd be really worried if he went to a place like Washington because I I think if he went to a place where they're like, well you're like a top three guy now and like you're gonna get all this all these chances like I think it would really hurt his development because he's kind of been the NBL I actually feel like was probably a wake up call and, and it really started to change how he played because he he was so used to being able to just do whatever he wanted. And the OTE and, and FIBA yep. stuff for France, you just kind of got to do whatever he wanted. And then he goes to the NBL and he's on a, a pretty, you know, a competitive team, a team that wanted to win. They made the playoffs and, you know, he played limited. He only played 20 minutes a game. And, um, you know, it's because they were like, hey, if you're not going to rebound and block out, we're going to take you out. Like, yep. you know, if, if you, you know, he really struggled early in the season with like making second efforts. Like, hey, if you, if you contest a shot, but then, you don't turn around to contest the offensive rebound. Like that's going to be an issue. Like, you know, and, and he kind of got better at that. And uh, I, I think going to a place where they're like, Hey, your job is to come here and you're going to shoot and we're going to play around with what you do. Right. We want you to attack off a closeout here and there. But you know, if, if he goes to Washington, I just feel like they're gonna be like, well, we're going to see if you can run 30 <laughs> DHOs a game. We're going to see if you can post up, we're going to see, and, and they're going to try all this stuff. And, and I think that would be bad for him. So for SARS sake, I, I'd be pretty happy um and and you know i i think if the hawks took sorry just be like yeah that's 
that's probably the right pick. It's the safe pick where where it doesn't take anything away from you team building wise versus some of the other guys I have in this range would probably, you know, force force their hand in, in one way or another in terms of their team building. So you brought up Risha Shea. Let's go to him quickly here. Um, sounds like you're a little lower on him, which is not – you're not alone in that. People are – there's a split on him too. Um, there is seems to be a lot of helium right now as we're talking. Uh, he's had some really good games recently. He's timing those games very well, getting a lot of coverage because he's you know he's one of the only guys playing right now, which is sometimes helpful for prospects when they're the only guy still playing in late May, uh, especially if they play well. Um, but, you know, and I, th- I think from what I've heard, he's, he's definitely on their board. I don't think he's – He's one. He's in consideration. That's what I would say, at number one overall. Um, but he's also a guy. You, you kind of touched on it, but I could see three years from now, him being a very, very good basketball player, and Hawks fans not being happy about it. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Because yeah. number one, I, I kind of agree with you on the star equity thing. Now, I think in this class in particular, yeah, it's nice to have star equity, but beggars can't be choosers. And if you get a really good player even number one overall, usually you want to get a star at number one overall. And I will acknowledge that it's a, it's the only spot on the draft board historically where you can kind of bank on kind of getting a star more often than not, or at least kind of, kind of close to that. Everywhere, everywhere else you can't, but in this class, I feel like you kind of have to adjust down. This is me talking. Um, and if you get a really uh, like a top, you know, 60 player in the league, who's a really good two way forward, that'd be a pretty good outcome. Um, can he be that is number one. And also, Drafting that number one, like philosophically for you, is that a player that you would consider here? It sounds like it sounds like no is your answer already based on what you said. But like, what is it? What does it look like for you as far as what he can and can't do? Yeah, you know, I, actually philosophically, I, I'm not against it. I I just think I'm I'm lower on the potential. It, it, if you told me Risache is going to shoot 39 percent from three over the course of his career on like solid volume, I'd say, yep, that's a that's a good playoff player. Yeah. Um, uh defensively he's he's really good on the ball like like you know i think there's some like i, I don't think he's quite as explosive laterally as like og and anobi but like there's there's a world where he's that caliber of defensive wing is just like a six eight you know strong big body dude who plays really hard i mean there's multiple times where he's you know uh picking up guards uh, at half court as they you know try to set a screen where he's fighting through things and you know there there's there's not a ton of like uh, there, there's a lot of little things he needs to clean up, but the NBA is really good at cleaning that stuff up. If, if you just have <laughs> the, the general, you know, the, the motor and, and the intangibles in the youth, um, you know, so I, I think there's, there's good stuff there. Um, I, I think uh, my, my worry is that he's going to be relegated to someone who just stands in the corner and is only shooting like 34% on those shots. Like that would know, be bad. Like, yeah, I would, like, that would, that would not be good. <laughs> I, 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 I like he's, he's I, to me, he has even less creation equity than like Deandre Hunter had coming out of Virginia. Wow. Like, okay. So that's like, let's, let's, let's examine that. Cause that was not something, well, I should say, let me, let me back up. Hunter is of course hitting close to home on this Hawks podcast. Mm-hmm. There were people that thought he was going to be able to do a little bit more on the ball than he ended up being mm-hmm. able to do. So I'll, I'll say that as a prospect, but I'm sure that will also raise eyebrows because uh, this it's not it's not necessarily a fair comparison. But because the last time the Hawks had a top five pick, they drafted DeAndre Hunter. Uh, that has been a comparison I've heard from Hawks fans who probably have mm-hmm. not seen Rich a ton. They probably just think, "What's what? Like, is this guy DeAndre Hunter?" It's like in a, in a derogatory manner is what they're asking. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and DeAndre's a, by the way, just to say it out loud. Gary is a pretty good NBA player. He's not a great player. It is what it is. Um, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not sure what the question is. It's more of like a shimmered on my spine when you mention that. But what? <laughs> what? I like, compare. So you 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 don't see the creation equity. By the way, that's that's one of my concerns too. Is that he mm-hmm. might just he might and I use just in not a pejorative way. He might quote unquote just be a catch and shoot guy. I think he can make decisions. But like again, not to go back to my point from a second ago, if you draft a guy number one overall who can't create. And isn't a, I get, if you're a center, it's a, it's a little bit more easy to understand. If you dropped a wing who isn't a creator and number one overall, people are like, people are gonna be like, what is going on here? Yeah. And, and that I think that's what it is is that, you know, if you look through his highlights, um, you know, and this is just, you know, anyone can do this, right? Anyone can watch highlights. Uh, it, it's hard to see a, a half court drive where he created an advantage off the dribble. That's just, I mean, he doesn't a whole, do a lot of that. I will acknowledge that for sure. There, there's a whole lot of step back jumper stuff that he tries to get to that, I, that I think is going to diminish some in the league. Um, you know, everyone who, who gets lauded for their, their, 
you know, step back or, or self-created shooting is actually like just a really good rim pressure guy who that stuff doesn't get acknowledged in the same way from, from <laughs> certain sects of fandom. So you notice all the tough shot making. You don't notice all the times they, they use that gravity to get to the rim. And Rishaw Shea doesn't have that. Um, he's a really good, he's, a, he's another guy. Both him and Zar are really good transition players. He's a am, very ambitious dunker. He will take off from well outside the and lane. And he is really long. I wish I had measurements. I'm sure you do too. Like he wasn't at the combine because he's still playing. I wish I had measurements mm-hmm. on him. But people will generally think he's a legit, he's at least 6'9", right? Like he's yeah. legitimately long. Six eight, six nine. Like, I I would guess probably six eleven, seven foot wingspan. Like like, which is good for a three. Yeah. He's super prototypical, like on ball wing defender. But I think right now, I mean, right now, and I think long term, he projects as a pretty atrocious off ball defender to me. Like I don't think there's a ton of, um, especially as the low man. Like he doesn't really block shots very well. He's not a great um reader of what offenses are doing. He doesn't diagnose things very well. But you know, he's an energy guy. He he. Well, I think he's going to be, like I said, a really good on-ball defender. The question is just to what level of shot uh, of shot maker can he be? And, and to me, I'm less confident in the numbers right now. It's it's fairly small sample size. Before this season, he didn't have a ton of tra- – like no one was like, oh, Zachary Rissache, the elite shooter, right? That, that was not <laughs> – I'm wary of guys who that's the sell when they only have a track record of one season. Um, and, you know, so – I, I'm not down, like I'm not out on him. Like I said, even even if they drafted him number one, I'd be like, I get it. Like, because again, I, there's guys I have ahead of him who you could never take number one. Like, you can't take Jalen Tyson number one. No, he's just it's just not not a world where that happens. But yeah, um, and and I, I just I, I'm just not sold on anything he does other than the on ball defense translating. And to me, that's when, when you combine like. I think I don't think there's a ton of ceiling there, and I also think the floor, just like with basically everyone, is not an NBA player. Uh, it's it's just a it's just a hard hard dice roll for me, I guess. Yeah, no, that, that's and look, while I think most people are higher than you are, based on, I think you know that based on what you just said, there are people that I talked to in the league that are closer to where you are. Like it, there's a split on all these guys, even Sar to I would say to a lesser extent, but there's a split on almost everybody, whether it's Klingon, whether it's Topic, like everybody's got detractors in this class. There's nobody that's like above reproach based on conversations that I've had with scouts and people around the league. There's always a big split. Um, one thing I, w- I would note, I wonder what you think. I know you mentioned shooting mechanics. One thing that I think I'm intrigued by of Risa Shea is that he is more, it seems like he's more of a movement shooter um, than, for instance, not to go like the Hunter comparison, but someone like Hunter, who just didn't really mm-hmm. do that at all. He was never doing that and still doesn't really do that. Um, and I think you mentioned before that the fit with him and Jalen is part of the appeal. Like, I don't, I don't love drafting with fit in mind at number one overall in particular, but in this class, and again, on this team with where I believe they still are, which is trying to win sooner rather than later, I think fit's going to matter more than it really ever does in number one overall because of what I just mentioned. Like, I think they, they care about Jalen as they should. Jalen's a building block for them, and they care about their guards. And everything else is kind of fitting around that. But I am intrigued by a Risa Shea, Jalen long-term front court because there's, there's a ton of length there, a ton of size there, especially if Risa Shea's shot works. And you kind of – we danced around it. He does have to shoot. Like, I, I, I don't think that there's anyone who would say he's a candidate and number one overall if he's just an okay shooter. He's got to be a plus shooter. It doesn't work, mm-hmm. I think. Is that, yeah, that's no, unreasonable? I, I'd agree. I, I'm with you where, like, there's some movement shooting equity. His, his To me, his best overall skill is his self-organization in tight spaces. Um, he, he's really, like, he has really good natural feel for um, his body orientation. I think that's part of what makes him such an interesting on-ball defender to me. Uh, he can get squared to the rim pretty easy. I think the, my biggest issue with his mechanics is he just gets lazy. He, start, he he does this thing where he wants to throw his back and land on one leg all the time. And it's like um, – <laughs> well, and, and they'll, they'll change that in a hurry. I, yeah, I, I, I would hope so, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and, I, and I also just don't know how good the – the touch is he's not, he has not been historically a very good free throw shooter. Um, I think his touch around the rim is pretty bad. Uh, and I worry that translates out a little bit. Um, but there's, there is a world where, you know, the self-organization being the skill that it is that, yeah, he could have some gravity. Um, and, and like, you know, I, I, I do think fit matters and, and um, at, at least at with this draft fit matters. And, and I think, yeah. you know, you are potentially talking about a really interesting front court, with Risache, you know, maybe Okongwu and Johnson, uh, where, you know, you have three guys who can all, you know, 
guard multiple positions defensively. A couple of those guys are potentially really good help guys. Two of those guys are really good passers. Maybe one of them is a good shooter. Like, like you know, there's there's some yeah. funk there, right? And, and I like that idea. I just uh, – Reese Alshay is one of those guys who I really like in concept. The, the, when I just talk about him on podcasts and stuff, like I'm right. like, oh, like he's he's really interesting. But every time I've watched him, and you know, obviously he's with him still playing, I've watched quite a bit. I just keep coming away like I, I just don't necessarily see it. Like like even even guys who aren't creators, you know, have more ability with the ball in their hands, or or have have more you know ability to to bend and get a hip and drive like. Uh, like there's a world like he can't even really attack a closeout. I don't think he can make dr- reads off the dribble. I think he's an okay passer from a standstill and he executes offense really well. Like that, that's something that does stand out is I think he's smart. Like, I think, I think he does execute what a team wants him to do really well, but I just, there, there's all these, he, there's a lot of connective tissue there that I worry doesn't, doesn't work. And, and, you know, like I said, that's just a tough guy for me to take above someone like Sar who, you know, I don't love Sar, but uh, there, there's a world Sar is like an all defense caliber defender who can make shots, right? And and that's uh, that's gold in the NBA at, in, at any point in time. Um, and Reese Shea doesn't quite have that, you know, elevator pitch that really moves me, I guess. Yeah, I, I tend to lean. Somebody actually asked me today offline. I might do this as a mailbag question in the future, but uh, somebody asked me like, you know, 95th percentile outcome between Sar and Risa Shea, who has a higher ceiling with that outcome. And it's interesting because you might, you know, in a lot, a lot of ways you would lean to the wing, right? The NBA, you, you would lean to, you would lean to the wing because that's the way the league is going in a lot of different ways. Unless you're like this, there's a couple of incredible center fulcrums and be Jokic, et cetera. Um, or not actually not, not et cetera, those two guys. Um, and maybe Wemby. Uh, but everybody else you would want is a perimeter player, right? So 95% percent off. If you, if you could just like erase all the negatives with Risa Shea and say, all right, what's the fully formed player versus Sar? You're t- I personally am tempted to say the wing, but given what you said, I, I still think like the super high ceiling Risa Shea is, I don't even know, was it like Paul George or something? Paul George is a great player. I'm not saying he's going to get there. Like, but that's like the most, and I'm terrible at comps, preference that right now. I'm awful with comps. But like I was trying to think of somebody that's like, okay, what is the hundredth percentile outcome of Zachary Shea and like a player I've recognized? It's kind of like Paul George, maybe. I don't know. Because Paul George couldn't dribble as a as a as a prospect. He's a better athlete than Risa Shea was. Obviously, there's there's it's not a perfect comp. But like Sar, I'm not gonna use the one that everybody uses, which is Giannis. That's just that's just a lot. I won't I won't do that. But like I think it's I think the ceiling is higher. I feel like Sar's ceiling is higher. That's me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, I, I'd, I'd agree with it's you. It's not all about that. It's not all about ceiling, because especially in this class, floor, take floor into account, take median into account. It's not just ceiling, but I still lean star on ceiling. Too. Yeah, I, I'd even lean like like I like to do 70th percentile outcomes. Like, it's very useful. You know, yep. Maybe it's like a Miles Turner versus a, you know, a, a bigger, a, a bigger, slightly better shooting PJ Tucker. You know, I'd probably lean Miles Turner there. Well, yeah, right? somebody like, – you know, uh, one that I keep using it, I can't remember who I stole it from, either Brian Schroeder or somebody that I know that's smarter than me, of like, of Risha Shea, if it, again, a high, a, not ceiling, but high end, like like a Trey Murphy. Yeah, yeah, that, that's good. Yeah. I like that comp. And I think Trey Murphy's really good. But if I polled Hawks fans and said, you get Trey Murphy at number one overall, most of them would not be very happy with that. And mm. I'm not saying they shouldn't be happy with that. I'm just saying, let's, this, th- there's, for everybody, but especially number one overall picks, there's going to be this expectation game with all of them. Star too. Like people are going to expect. I already have people telling me that he's going to start next year for the Hawks, and it's like, guys, he will not be one of the best five players next year. I assure you, he won't be. I mean, he might. Maybe he will be in in March, but he won't be in October. I'll bet you money on that. He he was mm-hmm. not like he was a twenty like like you said he was a twenty minute a game player in the NBL. <laughs> mm-hmm. He's not going to play thirty minutes a night for the Hawks next year. I don't think. Um, no matter. By the way, neither will Reese Shea. Uh, probably. Clean wouldn't either. We'll see. But anyway, that's those two guys. All right. That is all for part one of two with myself and Bryce. There is more to come on part two. So go ahead right now and find part two in your podcast player of choice. It should be available for you right now. Please subscribe to the podcast anywhere you might find podcasts. That includes, of course, YouTube. We're also on the audio platforms like up, like Apple and Spotify. We're also on Overcast, et cetera, et cetera. Ratings and reviews, definitely appreciated. Please follow the show on Twitter slash X at Lost on Hawks. Follow me there as well at BT Roland. Follow Bryce's work across the board in addition to all of that. And thank you for listening. As always, everybody, we'll see you next time with part two.